2020 has been an interesting year for the education program, as you can imagine. It felt a bit like the whole program was dissolved in March and then started again from scratch. So I'm going to take the first half of this program to, to bring you on that journey. Then the second half, I'm going to focus specifically on how to give a nature tour with a selfie stick, which is what you're seeing in the photo on there, um, on the title screen. This will be a little bit different than the other talks today. Hopefully it'll be a little bit of a fresh air and just reminding you about uh, that spark of, of wonder and the excitement of curiosity that you felt when you were a child discovering nature for the first time. And we're gonna talk about uh, some of the challenges of virtual remote education, but also the positives. And I've been surprised by how many positives there have been. Try to imagine back in time uh, at the beginning of March when things were starting, you know, businesses, uh, everything was starting to shut down. The picture on the bottom left there was the last program that we did here it was March 8th, and that was a talk on gopher tortoises. And you can see there's even one person with a face mask sitting in the back of the back of the um, auditorium there. We canceled just about everything. We, we shut the gates, sent staff home, sent volunteers home, stopped doing field trips, public programs, all of that. And it was quickly, uh, you know, we realized pretty, pretty quickly that we needed to transition to start making virtual learning experiences. A team was formed. This was a cross departmental team and we called ourselves the community engagement team. And we had to, like I said, it was a little bit like the education program uh, dissolved and then we had to invent a new one from scratch. And that was what this team's job was. And it worked, we were able to pull it off and do summer camp, uh, nature tours, public events, seminars, all of that, but to do it virtually, just like we're doing today. I remember when, uh, when we, first started doing this in late March, we, we realized, okay, we're going to try to figure this out. For me, as someone who's been giving, you know, in-person outdoor tours for years, my first thoughts were, how could you possibly create anything of value for the, for the children when you can't be outside together? And maybe that's what you're, you're thinking too. And for a field station, Education at a field station is so much about having uh, having that that time to be out um, to to make your own choices of what you want to look at to be able to observe and investigate things out in nature and uh, it's pretty hard to do that if you can't get out there. But now sitting here at the end of the year, I can say that there there were a lot of positives that came out of this. And I think that these are all, um, these are all lessons and uh, these are tools, tools that we have now that five years from now we'll still be using. But I do wanna focus on some of these positives that we didn't even think about going into this. Essentially having to reinvent our outreach as remote virtual education really pushed us uh, to adapt uh, technology in, in a way that we hadn't before. We were always interested in trying out technology for education and, and doing new things, but this was a quantum leap for us. H having smartphones, webcams, and, and Zoom everywhere made it really easy to involve more presenters, to bring guests in, to collaborate across long distances and to create video projects um, just with, you know, with a smartphone and, and a computer. So we didn't have to go and, and hire a professional team. We could create this content ourselves. There's some photos here of great examples of this. The top right was a surprise party we did for Hillary Swain's 25th anniversary working at Archbold. And this was wonderful because we told her it was going to be an event with board members. 
And she gets on and says, wait a second, you know, what's, what are my relatives doing on here? <laughs> we were able to pull in, you know, uh, relatives, uh, board members, staff, people from all, all across the country that had known her or worked with her. In the bottom right, that's a picture of the artist Deborah Mitchell and our researcher Reed Bowman, who was on a little earlier. She came and did a, did a project where she interviewed researchers, but we took her interviews and then we also took the art, the, the drawings, paintings, photography of hers and put it together as a video. So we, we could combine the artwork that she was making inspired by research at Archbold and overlay it on top of the scientific interviews, which is something we've never tried doing before. And then on the bottom left is an example of just kind of getting creative. This, that was an event, Colors of the Florida Scrub that we did for Earth Day. And because it's, it was so simple to just pull in our, our researchers on their, on their webcams, we did, we did a fun panel called the Colors of the Florida Scrub. It was, it was a little different and a little more creative than we had done before. And it was because we could, we could do it easily. Not, I should say there is definitely a lot of practice and big learning curve here. So when I say easily, I just mean we could get the presenters. This is our YouTube page, which we've had for several years. To give you an idea of how many videos we normally produce for it, last year we had four new videos. 2020, we're going to have over 60 new videos. Once I add all of these videos for today, we've got like 17 videos to add from, from today. We had, had a lot of new content for YouTube. We also created new playlists because there was so much new content and it makes our YouTube page a whole lot more fun now. I recommend giving it a try. What's so wonderful about this is that we can take seminars like this or, um, or virtual programs for kids or the project like we did with the artist Deborah Mitchell. And now it has a place where it lives online. And instead of just the few people that would have shown up, um, like let's say we do a nature walk or special talk here, maybe you've got 10, maybe you have 50 people. Now hundreds of people or potentially thousands of people will be able to watch these videos over their lifespan on YouTube. I love this collaboration. We are working currently right now with the Organization of Biological Field Stations to uh, create we, this website is a new website, the virtual field. And the idea here is uh, all of these different field stations came together, 50 plus field stations from around the world and said, since colleges aren't coming to us anymore to teach their biology classes because they, they can't come to us this year, um, how do we make content, virtual content that uh, can get those students to practice their observation skills. So, so Archbold has been a leader in, in this project. Um, the other, so part of that is making exploration videos, uh, which are basically like not talking and filming as you, as you walk through a habitat, but it's a little more complicated than that. And then also doing live events where you have multiple field stations going live at the same time. We, we hosted one on prescribed fire. So we could talk about our history of fire here and what was going on. And then we could look at what was happening out west with fire uh, on the same day. And this was primarily for college students. So they could get on and they could see the different types of habitats and how research related to fire was enacted in different places. We did manage to run a virtual summer camp. We did cancel our in-person camp. We refunded our, our families and offered a virtual camp for free. The, it included Zoom meetings with the, with the campers, as well as virtual guided field trips with the selfie stick and at-home activities for the kids to do, exploring nature in their neighborhoods. And we also even had some teenage volunteers make videos at home, like Carter Lighty in the bottom right there, uh, made a video about how to make an insect trap. And right now we just, as of yesterday, got this website going live, Archbold's virtual school year. 
and we are just starting to book uh, classroom Zoom visits um, uh, with, with school teachers in the area. And this is available to schools anywhere. So that's one of those benefits too, that we, um, we can reach a much water, wider audience than before. In our summer camp, for example, we would have, um, typically there might be eight, eight students in a session and one or two of them wasn't from Florida. So the students got to interact with, with other children that were from you know, Texas or California or New York or you know, wherever, which, which, at, which added a really interesting dynamic that we don't normally have at summer camp. Uh, that's a shot from the from the new uh, education page. So we have a variety of options that teachers can choose from, and these we're offering uh, at no charge. Let's jump into these live from the outdoors. Uh, we we've called them different things: the discovery science, the discovery classroom. We call them in the beginning, or just summer camp virtual field trips. We're going to start these up again just in a few weeks in the beginning of, of January. Every Tuesday, I'll be out with my cell phone and a selfie stick on different nature trails. So it's actually live and you're getting to see what flowers are blooming. Maybe a snake goes across or I come across an armadillo or a toad or something. This is the program, the type of program where I really tried to take that list from earlier that said, what do we do when you can't have self-guided learning and you don't have the kids together working as a group? Uh, and tried to address as much of that as I could uh, through a virtual tour. And I could not meet all of those things, of course, but I want to show you how it can work. These are the lessons that we learned from our team here. Now, I'm the one who's usually in front of the camera, but keep in mind, this is a whole team of people that are working on these, uh, on these projects. We have a, a nature tour checklist. When I am coming up with how I'm going to structure the uh, 45 minutes out on that nature tour, this is, this is the, the broad outline that's in my head, you know, having a theme, picking where I want to go, having a couple of you know, two or three different places that I can walk to, uh, they're next to each other, reminding myself to, to change um, the, the perspective of, of the camera. So sometimes I get right down on the ground or try to hold the camera up and put a wide view on, that kind of thing. Having expert guests in there. And, and then I, I like to have an arts cultural connection in there if I can as well. I should say that our first attempt at this, which I think was like the first week of April or something, um, had, had a lot of technical problems. I lost uh, internet out there two or three times. <laughs> my camera or my, my phone was over, I think it was because it was overheating. Uh, it actually, and it overheated um, many times throughout the, we've done 10 of these programs so far. We had, so we had issues like that, um, all kinds of little things that we had to get worked out. So the first time you try this, it's not gonna be perfect. So it, it was very encouraging when, when I started getting messages here and there from other people um, and sometimes educators saying, hey, your, your team is actually really figuring this out. So I love this quote here. This was an educator that had emailed me saying, um, I want you, I did want you to know that most of us recognize that you have raised the bar with your successes and it's really a pleasure to follow, follow your work. That's really, feels really good. We aimed this at kids, but we wanted it to be for the general public too. And we actually have had five-year-olds as well as, you know, PhD professors and retired people, you know, grandparents watching with their grandkids. We've had the whole gamut. And the thing is, when you get outside and are, you show that, that nature uh, is interesting to you and you got a smile on your face and you're looking at a bunch of cool stuff, it seems to appeal to everyone. Then we have the question and answers at the end. So for the people who really do want to dive into the science more, they can stick, they can stick around for that part. I'm going to show you... Uh, some different clips. Um, this is supposed to be muted here because I want to talk over it, but 
let me go. Okay. So here are some of the, the tricks and some of the, some of the things that we did to make our program a success. One thing is that you can buy little lecture lenses that you just stick right onto the back of your, of your cell phone. You can buy inexpensive ones for uh, around $40, or you can buy you know, the, the more professional types that are around $100 a piece. But check that out. That's a, that was from a kit that we bought. I think it was 35 bucks. And I can right in, in the middle of, of the program, just boop, stick it right on there and take a close up look at some flowers. That helps us to simulate what it would be like if you, if you were uh, out on the nature tour yourself and you want to get real close up and look at something. So I, I, love, I love this as a tool. Um, I'll say that it is much better to have that part planned out because if you do try it on the spur of the moment when you see something cool, it can be, it can be difficult to get things in focus. It can be tough to do. Keep, I'm going to keep these muted too, but I just want to give you an idea here. Uh, I tried to have a, a, a guest on every one of these. So we could uh, have, have me out in the field and then take a five minute break while I let my phone cool down. I'd stick it into uh, a little cool, uh, literally into a cooler, <laughs> literally uh, with an ice pack in there and then have uh, somebody else in their office or at home um, going live and doing a little presentation. So this was one that we did on skulls. So that's, that's Emily. Uh, so I was out in the field. They said, all right, now we're gonna go to Emily. And she answered a poll question to make it interactive with, with the visitors or with the attendees. We could pop up questions like, what's the best way to clean an animal skull? hydrogen peroxide or boiling or, you know, sparing it in your backyard. And then the expert can come on and answer the question and go into their short presentation. And then when they're done, boop, goes right back to me. And then the expert is still there for the question and answer. Let's hold on one second. Here we go. And I try to always put in a little bit of uh, arts and culture, uh, either history or literally music into the programs. For example, when we were at Lake Annie, I was filming from a kayak <laughs> and we, we played a clip of music that was made by researcher Evelyn Geyser, uh, who took temperature data from our lake and turned it into a classical music composition. So I'm actually out there live rowing you know, out on my kayak while listening to the music. And this is the view that the, the attendees have. So they're getting to see me have a moment while the music is going on, uh, see me experience it. And then we had, we had Evelyn on and she was able to talk about that project and answer questions. Uh, this one I'm actually going to turn the sound on for because this, is, this was my favorite, uh, this was my favorite one. One of, one of the, the tools that we have is pre-recording. You never know what you're going to see when you're actually out, out on, you know, in nature. So for example, we were trying to uh, put out some fish traps and I did go out the day of the, the, the program and put fish traps out the, the, or the day before and we didn't catch anything. So luckily I had gone out, I think it was four or five times going to this pond um, and practicing and preparing for the for this live event, um, and set out traps uh, two two times before the actual live event, so that I knew we could record and get something that worked. Here we go. Back again this morning. Let's see if we found anything different. More tadpoles. <laughs> A whole lot of tadpoles. Tadpoles. Let's lift it up and see if we've got anything here. <gasps> we just hit the mother load. <laughs> we've got something pretty cool right here. Any guesses? What could this little beastie be? <laughs> 
This is a giant salamander called an Amphiuma. Um, I'm gonna go check the other traps and I'll come back here and put my phone on the tripod and uh, let him out of the cage. <laughs> If I could have picked one thing to find out here this morning, it would be a two-toed amphiuma right here. There are mud turtles, there's water snakes, and we could have caught both of them in this little minnow trap, but this is what I was hoping. I love, I really love that segment. It, it, it makes me so happy. You see in there, I was actually asking the attendees questions. Hey, what do you think we caught in here? Because the, we have the chat in Zoom too. So there's a little bit of interaction that the uh, that the kids can have writing, uh, writing in what they what they see. And I'll try to ask them questions throughout the program. And I can see their I can see even though I'm just on my phone, I can see their chat messages pop up briefly as they're coming in. Again, we, we uh, can't totally replicate the experience of being out there on, you know, really outside and experiencing these things. But me as the personality on camera, I think of myself like the avatar for the, the viewer and they can experience that joy of lifelong learning and the wonder of nature uh, with me if I'm properly demonstrating it for them. So that's a big part of my strategy when I'm doing these things. This is the last clip I'm gonna show. I'll turn the sound off again for this one. Uh, this was another pre-recorded part for, for one of these events. And what I wanted to show that was kind of fun is I actually filmed it from my car. I mean, we're on a little dirt, private dirt road here. I'm going very slow. But we, because of being able to make video segments without a lot of uh, equipment, uh, I could make a little adventure kind of film here. And I, I did the live event at the ranch, but the internet at the ranch uh, was, the, the, yeah, the, the cell connection at the ranch was not so good. So I couldn't do the live event by like walking around to different spots. I had to just stay near the buildings. But having a video like this allowed me to still make it feel like for the, for the participants that we were traveling through the property. So I was in my car and then I went, um, you know, go, walking through ditches and doing fun stuff like that. What do you need to pull this off? Well, there's all those little tips uh, and tricks that I was showing you. I'm sure there's more that people could figure out. That's just what our team, um, you know, what worked for our team. But there's not one way to do this. I'm, sh I'm sure of that. And, uh, and we're still, I'm hoping we'll find more things uh, in the coming months. But essentially, you, you, need a, you need a cell phone. We found having a MiFi was very helpful. That's a, a, a mobile hotspot. So we could use the, instead of using the data plan on my phone, we could use Wi-Fi, which helps keep it from overheating. I've also got cooling pads. I'd stick a cooling pad on, on the back. In this photo, you don't see a cooler, but I would usually have a cooler and I'd stick the phone in the cooler as well. Um, for doing the pre-recording, having a, um, that other kind of funky looking tripod there is a smartphone stabilizer. Having that was really helpful for, for pre-recording. And at the time when we were doing all of these, we actually didn't have a microphone system. We were just using, just using my Google Pixel phone's uh, microphone. But since then we've bought a microphone system. We've also upgraded the lens kit that we were using at the time. So we've slowly upgraded this as we've gone along. To wrap up here, some takeaways. Uh, in terms of resources, this was a, the, this was a big, uh, undertaking and it, and it continues to be a big undertaking but on the other hand there was no choice our all of our outreach and educational programming was either going to be virtual or going to be not at all so we you know we had to do this and um, 
it was a lot it was a lot of teamwork remains a lot of teamwork but there's been some positives that that have been so wonderful like the collaboration i know it being uh being an educator being an environmental educator one of the things that's fun is collaborating and i've never been able to collaborate nearly as much as i have this last year and we've been able to reach more people like i said if we do a, a live event here you know, a nature tour you you don't want more than 20 25 people on a trail at the same time or it's too many people but by doing these we we could have a hundred or even an even a couple hundred people on at the same time while we were out adventuring out there no it's not the same as being out there and there are there aren't there together and there are some issues like um not not having a role for our volunteers or being worried that we were going to start to lose connections with the local families that we've that we've worked on our relationships with for you know so many years um but i think that when we do return to open doors and live events in the future we still will continue to do uh, a mix of these other virtual presentations they're too it, it's it reaches too many people and it's too good <laughs> to give it up uh, I'd like to thank the the team of, I mean, there's more people than this, but Margaret, Joe, Deborah, Laura, Megan, and Hillary have been the ones that have put a lot of time in on these virtual programs. The ones that I've been most involved with, with like those virtual selfie stick tours. Um, but just like today where we have 17 presentations, so many staff have been involved with giving virtual programs this year. So it's involved pretty much all of the whole Archbold staff. And with that, if there's time, I would be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dustin. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and point out that you need to read your chat now. You've got a lot of wonderful comments coming in. Um, a lot of people participated in your virtual events, including myself and my boys. They were definitely a light in a very dark time in the spring when we had to go to virtual and none of us knew what we were doing. <laughs> Thank you so much for that from a personal um, note. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. One, I think you kind of answered, but if you could just maybe give two or three quick uh, suggestions from Clara Mullen. She wanted to know if you had any issues with connectivity in the field. Well, definitely. Um, having the MiFi was helpful, but the main uh, takeaway, which I didn't write out explicitly, is practice, practice, practice. So it takes a lot more work to put on one of these live events than to do a normal live, uh, you know, in-person presentation. So you need to go, you know, two or three times to the same site and, and make sure that your internet's working, practice it all. Um, Cause yeah, it is, it is definitely an issue. I do think that the viewers are generally pretty forgiving of it though especially in the beginning of the pandemic when people were pretty desperate and they were stuck at home they they didn't mind if if you got cut if you got cut off and, and stuff um so the myfi is helpful but you some like the ranch we still even with the myfi could not go to the access the areas that we wanted to so i had to just stick next to the buildings when we did the event Great. And I'm going to ask you part of Viv's question just really quick because I really like it. Um, she wants to know how you like doing these virtual events compared to in-person events. They're so different. They feel more, I like them. They feel more like a play, like a one person play or like you're part of a TV show or something. <laughs> it feels like, I mean, you're out there by your own by, or by yourself, but, you, but what's fun is that you have the other like the guests that are at their house or at their at their office so you're getting to interact and go back between people and so i i do think they're really fun but um i i would never by choice stop doing in-person tours you know i, I want to keep doing them. 